a uh, good uh, Wednesday afternoon. This is Les Johns with the uh, More With Less podcast of the Zoom edition, volume two. And then we're sitting here today with uh, former Wake Forest linebacker great Brandon Chubb. Uh, Brandon, welcome to the More With Less podcast. Appreciate you having me, Les. How's it going? Going well. It's a little strange these days for sure. Um, yeah. I've been home, I think this is 39 straight days. The only trip <laughs> I've really made out of the house is to run to Charlotte and go get some Chewies for my daughter's birthday. <laughs> but uh, it looks like you got a nice little office set up though. So it looks a little yeah, it's, 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 it's good for the most part. Uh, there are times it gets unwieldy and a little bit messier than I would like, but uh, mm -hmm. you know, a little tidying up here or there. I actually moved, I packed up, I'm a CD collector. I'm a big music collector. And I had probably about six to 8,000 music CDs that I packed up recently. Wow. So I could move my exercise bike in here <laughs> so I could try wow. to incorporate a little bit right. of physical activity. That's important. I moved, I moved the bike in. I can't say that I've done a whole lot of the actual <laughs> physical activity, Brandon. So maybe I need you to kind of push me through that. I don't know. I got you. Yeah, we'll, we'll work something out. A little yeah. Zoom, Zoom inspiration meeting. I need that. I need that for sure. Um, catch Wake Forest fans up, Brandon. What's, what's life been like for you over the last year or two? What are you into now? Um, and, and take out the coronavirus out of the equation, what would life be like for Brandon Chubb right now if it wasn't for the pandemic? Uh, so if it wasn't for the pandemic, um, I would be training right now, training full, going for uh, training camp and stuff like that. But I've also been proactive since 2017 when I tore my ACL. I had that whole year off of injured reserve. And I just, you know, started working on life off the field for Brandon and uh, exploring my interests, exploring the things I – you know, couldn't do as a student athlete at Wake because our summers and springs were taken up and, you know, consumed with football. So just uh, building on that portfolio and building on that background. And that has led me now, I think the corona, as, as you know, being sensitive to everything that's happening that's traumatic as far as deaths and people getting sick and losing loved ones, um, it, it, it gives, and I was talking to Clawson two days ago and I, we were saying the same thing, it gives us a chance to put the world on pause, you know? So Clawson mentioned he works 100 hours a week and he's been doing that since his days at, you know, Fordham. So imagine, you know, now he gets to spend more time with his family. I get to spend more time with my family. I get to spend more time learning about branding and building Brandon and making Brandon better. And so I use that time to um, start uh, forming a, a business venture with a, a actually a, a former teammate at Wake. I won't say his name just because of the uh, circumstance that he still has a job at another place and I don't want to have any conflicts of interest, but starting a business venture and uh, looking forward to that as well. That's fantastic. Uh, what sort of field is the business venture in? Yeah, Brandon, could, can you go that far? I could definitely elaborate on that. It's um, in, in alternative investments. So uh, it's very preliminary right now, but either venture capital or uh, private equity. And I just learned being in the NFL and, and being able to, Justin Forsett, when I was on, when I was in Alliance, tore my ACL, he just happened to be the neighbor to my agent. And I was at my agent's house for a week after surgery before I got back on the plane. And this guy has a, a company called Shower Pill. It was actually featured on Shark Tank. And one of the things he told me was to leverage the shield while you have it. And uh, that stuck with me, you know, since 2017. And that's everything I've done in my life is to leverage that shield. People want to be around me. People want to talk around about me and, and get to know me while I'm an NFL player. And, and, you know, the vitality of this game at the most out of the last 10 years. So being able to leverage that and, and leverage my network and leverage the guys I've, I've met in the locker room. So venture capital, I think, would be a great one of being a, a co-investor with a venture capital, a successful venture capital firm. And there are a few that I have connections with that I think can uh, be very prosperous for athletes. So it's paying it for, you know, taking athlete, athlete capital, also outside investors as well. It's not just strictly athletes, but that's my strong, strong suit. And that's where the most value lies in it uh, as far as my network and me being able to leverage it. So taking capital and just co-invest, co-investing co with uh, other venture capital firms who, who kind of do the dirty work and I just kind of learn from it to, you know, later down the road, me and my partner do our own thing and, and venture off into our own uh, fund, whether it's venture capital, private equity, being able to create value, you know? That's, that's interesting. And one of the things you talked about, which I really keyed in on to me, Brandon, was this is kind of a, a time of opportunity. And, and once again, you, you, like you said, you want to be sensitive, but yeah. I had said for probably months that I had so much work backlog that I kind of wish the world would stop for X amount right. of time just so I could catch up. And this is one of those weird times where, you know, we can take advantage of this next month or two months or however long this is 
to right. kind of build ourselves as people and right. build our, our brand and build our, um, our portfolio in, internally. And it right. sounds like that's exactly what you're doing, Brandon. Right. And you, you understand it best because you cover football. So you understand the rigors of, you know, covering spring practice, covering uh, summer uh, training camp, covering the season, covering the bowl season. So you understand that your life is really never able to just sit back and, and pitch, put your feet up and kind of focus on less and what can less maximize the potential? What can I leverage, you know, sharpening your tools. So it's just giving us an opportunity to do that. And I think us as a, as a, a country, if we all kind of had that mindset, we could come out of this thing stronger, you know, even barring all the things that have already happened to, you know, the unfortunate people that caught the virus or have been affected by it. Speaking of which, uh, what are you doing to, to kind of stay in shape and stay healthy, both mentally and physically, Brandon? <laughs> Obviously, you've got a lot going on business-wise, so that yeah. has to help on the, on the mental end for sure. Yeah, so I, I would say I would start, I'm going to start physically. Um, it wasn't much. You know, the gym's closed. Uh, so You're I in Atlanta, right? Atlanta. So I would say the gyms are the most – you know, contractable areas to be in because you're sweaty. You already wiped down your equipment because you don't want to get somebody's funk or must on you. So imagine what the virus and, and that spreading. So I actually had to purchase gym equipment that is, you know, being price gouged and is selling out everywhere. But luckily through a strength coach, I was able to uh, use their wholesale account to uh, purchase some gym equipment. So now I work out of my garage every day. I live in a neighborhood that has a hill from my house. I'm, I live at the bottom. So I just run up the top and that's how I get my cardio. Uh, mentally though, I just started a book club. Uh, so I have 20 or 30 people in my book club and I've been reading for the past two months, uh, diving into books and I thought, why not make it social? So like how me and you were on zoom and you're making this podcast kind of social as far as people being able to see us. And I th thought, you know, that'd be good mentally for everybody, you know, get some social elements in it and it encourages us to still stay at home and, and protect all the people who are vulnerable to this disease. So uh, mentally, you know, staying busy with the business thing and, and working on that, that venture that I was just telling you about, but also reading books, you know, and, and, and learning new things, um, finance, financial books like Bad Blood, Enron, The Smartest Guys in the Room, uh, Barbarians at the Gate. I just asked Clausen when I talked to him two days ago about books and he suggested three that he's reading right now so that's mentally how i just kind of stay away from things and kind of take my mind off of it what do you think of clausen's beard oh it's uh i honestly thought it was a filter when i first saw it i thought <laughs> it was like you know like a snapchat filter of like the uh how those uh filters kind of make you look 20 or 50 years older i thought it was one of those and then i uh saw more content and i was like, oh that's real so yeah i mean i'm surprised he he, he always was clean shaven I never, you know, could see him growing out a beard that that thick and, and that long. So I was impressed, actually. What 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 other tidbits did you get from Coach Carlson when you chatted with him? Uh so just asking him about because uh, I I was going to do all this when we did the golf outing during the spring before the spring game, and I was going to catch up with him then. But just being able to ask about you know things I saw during the season and, and you know his thoughts on it, and then you know, his thoughts on things moving forward and and how the team and outlook looks this year and you know, just kind of getting that inside scoop of, and, you know, just talking player to coach. Um, but, yeah, I mean, that's really what I got just to catch up on Wake Forest football. And then we talked about a little uh, little bit of stuff, life off the field as far as, like I told you, he he's enjoying more family time because he's worked 100 hours a week his whole life and, you know, being able to, you know, recommend books and, 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 and things like that. I think I think I actually caught him in a workout. He was breathing pretty hard, so I think he's staying active as well. You know, Carson's a guy who – has a routine and he gets his workout in, I think six or seven, right before the players get their workout in. So um, I think, you know, being able to catch up and, and, and just talk football, like I was a player, it was, it was pretty fun. I see him many times before his like uh, Tuesday press conferences, mm -hmm. he'll be running around the campus and then he just magically changes into right. a suit and tie. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know how he does it. So yeah. he, he's, he looks all crisp and ready to go. It, it's amazing. Right. Entertainment-wise, while we're talking about Clausen for, for a second, you talked about yeah. he usually works 100-hour work weeks. He might have backed off a little bit, but how many hours do you think he's working now? What, what's your guess? Honestly, because that's another thing I asked him, was just the obstacles of um, recruiting. You can't, you know, go in a player's home right now, You and this is the time you kind of really make groundwork on juniors and rising seniors. Uh, so I would say he's still, you know, still – I would take 20 hours off of that. That's what I was thinking. Guy, he's, he's, a, he's a sharp guy, and, he, and, and, and he's very on top of things. So, you know, he wants to, you know, 
he understands that if you if you take your foot off the gas, you know, it's it's gonna gonna be a last place race. And he, at Wake Forest, you can't do that because well, I mean, the media is gonna pick Wake class anyway. <laughs> right, and then at the end of the day, like, uh, no offense to any of these coaches, they're great coaches, but Dabble's Dabble can you know take his foot off the gas and and send a recruit a picture of that little complex they just built, and you know, that's a recruiting pitch. You know, wait, we have a nice complex as well, but we also have to you know get to know a player because Clawson made a great point. Um, hopefully, he doesn't mind me saying this, but our mistakes don't leave. You know, our our recruiting you know mishaps stay away. You know, it's not for the most part. Bit. Yeah, yeah, it's not a different school where, you know, there's other options that you can go and still get that same education and still play at such a high level. So, um, yeah, I think probably t- I'll take 20 hours out for that, right. so 80. <laughs> we're, we're thinking about the same. I was thinking 70 right. to 80 probably still. And probably so, it's probably harder so- because of the challenge, you know. The Zoom the Zoom and with every player, that probably takes up a lot of time because he told me he made sure he talks to every player every day. Um, recruiting, I mean, now I got to talk to a kid over the phone and, it's just, there's no, really no wow factor you're seeing in my kitchen. So there's no wow factor. It's, you know, now i got to elaborate more and get to know the player more and build a better relationship, which takes longer time. But He said he, he told me when we talked the other day, he was my first Zoom podcast last week, uh, doing the same thing you're doing with me now. He told me he's actually more involved in the early stages of recruiting the kid than what he usually is because he has this time and, and also because they're not going to have that in, in-person evaluation period that they're used to which they right. use so, so, so rigorously at Wake, so. And he, and he said that was big for them, um, being able to, that's their, that's their whole recruiting core is, is the in-person evaluations. And um, he was talking about how now you got to be, because people are going to fill up quicker, you know, guys are going to commit now. So you got to, you got to get it a little earlier and get, get, uh, get to the party a little earlier. So aside from books, your business and stuff like that, entertainment-wise, uh, have have you have you watched have you have you binged any good Netflix series? Is there anything that that Brandon's uh, done from an entertainment perspective that you've enjoyed the last month? Yeah, so I, I'm I'm a big I'm a big guy as far as when it, when it comes to entertainment. At the end of the day, I got to learn something from it. So I did the Tiger King thing like everybody else, and that was very entertaining because that's you know something you don't think about about you know, being able to pet a tiger and these tigers being in, in zoos and just the drama that you never knew went behind that. So that was very entertaining. But so, now so, did, so did Baskin kill her husband? <laughs> I mean, probably. It's, 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 it's definitely a probable chance. It's, it's, um, her characteristics were very sketchy. But uh, so, I mean, who knows? But, oh, I was uh, saying, like, I watched a lot of documentaries. So I binge a lot of documentaries on Netflix now and, and, and learning, you know, about things I never would have thought of, like ph- big pharmaceutical companies ripping off customers or whatever it may be, is you know shorting the stock on Herbalife because it's a pyramid scheme and just stuff like that is is uh pretty interesting. The documentary sessions is where I get my binge on on Netflix. Gotcha, makes sense. So um, I noticed on your Twitter account you you uh, make the admonition that Pluto is a planet. Yeah. State your case. Why is Pluto a planet? Because it, it was definitely. Um, and it kind of, it kind of relates to me. It was, it was considered a planet, and and it's then now they call it a, um, a mini planet or whatever they call it. But it's, it's now it's the underdog, and and and, and you want to count it out because it doesn't size up to the other planets. I think that was the classification. They didn't meet the the the, the cir- 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 circumference of a of a planet size. Um, but I mean, at the same time, we've been you know learning Pluto as a planet since we were kids. We you know, counted it as a planet, and 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 now it kind of gets pushed to the side. Uh, so Pluto's definitely a planet. It's just you know they're sleeping on it. It's 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 the underdog story, and I, I always pull for a good underdog. So, um, how are your astronaut dreams faring these days? Are you are you doing any work to to maybe one day go into space? And and you know, if so, can we? If so, can we finally have live sports in space since we can't <laughs> have live sports here right now? So two things on that. I, I I don't know if you saw, but NASA was holding applications to apply for to be the, the next round of astronauts and um i didn't meet the requirements because I, I think i didn't have a uh undergrad in stem or or mba but i still applied anyway didn't get accepted and then also last night ironically that you brought that up shooting stars were in the sky so i saw yes. a couple of shooting stars i got to catch those um so it, it definitely shows some promise that you know the the the, the dream can still happen and um, Mars, they found water on Mars, and so now we're about to get inhabitable, uh, inhabitable planets in the in the future. So I'm looking forward to it. Hopefully, you know, being able to use that scientific discovery to to make something out of it. 
what's it like having such a uh, football family uh, during these lockdown times? You guys staying in touch a lot? Uh, have have y'all seen each other? Yeah. So no, we haven't seen each other, but we do stay in touch a lot. Uh, we we stayed in, we stay in touch, you know, even before the COVID nineteen happened. But you know, rallies in Denver, Knicks uh, in Cedar Town, and then in Cleveland. Uh, and you know, I don't go around my parents just because I don't want to. They're they're more vulnerable than I am, so I don't want to you know bring anything that I didn't know I was carrying. And so we all stay in touch. We're we're in a group chat, and you know, it's hard to talk about uh, sports when there's no sports going on. So we just send each other memes or funny things on Twitter, and just just roll from there. What's what's the Chubb optimism level that there will be an NFL season and a, and a college football season this coming year? <laughs> Last, I'm gonna be honest with you, man. Um, so I get a little, I get a little bit more inside information. My mom's a, a chief of staff for the mayor of Atlanta, so you know things are a little bit more uh, privy to her. And just from what I'm hearing, it's, it's not looking too well. And Georgia just opened back up, and I think that would just you know, spiral things down a little bit uh, further than we than we expect. Um, I saw I saw is. the mayor. I saw the mayor of Atlanta on one of the cable shows uh, just in, right. I think last night or the night before. Very right. impressive lady. Yeah, and uh, so I mean, I hope there's a season. I really do. Uh, I would say it's a 70, 60 percent chance. Um, Death. Do I think there will be fans in the stadiums in twenty twenty? I do not. If there is a season, um, but hopefully there is a season because a lot of livelihoods are on that. And I hope there are fans in the stadium because, you know, a lot of people who work the games and concessions and, you know, arena operations and things like that need to make a, a living as well. But I well, do the think one thing that with, with the TV rights, though, Brandon, I mean, theoretically, if we can get the games played with the TV rights and the money and, and perhaps even an enhanced TV package, because everybody will be watching right. on TV. You know, those Cubs could probably put something together for their workers. With that, I with agree, that and I thought about that because the, the TV revenue is a, a a big chunk of that pie, and and that's a that's one of the the, the kings of, of as far as the the revenue circle. So I do think because a lot of more people will be in their homes watching these live sports instead of you know paying a hundred dollars a ticket to go there, that they can negotiate that in uh, TV contracts. And I think the TV deal this is the last year for it, so I think <laughs> that could be a um, you know, a very, very uh, good leverage point. And hopefully, you know, the owners do do the right thing and use that money and that extra revenue to be able to still trickle it down and at least put a plan into action to give workers and stadium, you know, stadium employees some kind of out or at least some kind of slow exit or windfall, you know, so. Yeah, you've got those ticket takers, concession workers, parking lot right. attendants. I mean, you got everything. You, you got, got all those folks that are just like, yeah. In the, yeah. you know, in the wind right now. And so my uh, girl works for the Atlanta Hawks, and I mean, she's in social media, so she doesn't really, you know, whether it stands or not, doesn't really affect her. But you know, just thinking of the reality of you know the NBA season, if there's not playoffs, imagine how many people you know make money because of the last 20 games that they're missing out on. So it's tough. Yeah, it's 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 tough for sure. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about Wake for just a moment. Uh, obviously, your first, your last two years here at Wake were uh, Dave Clawson's first two, and you guys, I know, didn't win as many games as you hoped. Uh, do you take a sense of pride, though, in what's happened? You know, you were the building blocks of that program under Dave Clawson, and since then, they've now been to four straight bowl appearances. Is that something that Brandon Chubb takes pride in? Uh, it's, it's definitely something I take pride in. I was just talking to uh, Clawson about this, Ashley, and um, when you're a leader, you have to you have to make sacrifices, you have to buy in, and you have to uh, sacrifice not personally, but for the greater good. So it's not a good enough to say, well, I, I bought in personally. I'm Brandon Chubb. I, you know, I sacrifice my weekends and, and going out on Thursdays to make the team better and to listen to the coaches and be, you know, hunt, at my best for 6 a.m. winter workouts. Uh, it's, you know, that's, that's not enough. It's more about being able to take the freshmen who are looking up to me or the, you know, the guys who are going off the beaten path and, I know they have potential, even if that potential is in jeopardy of taking my position or superseding me. Uh, you know, being a leader is, is being able to, you know, try to get that all in order. And the guys that um, have been, you know, successful at that as far as in the bowl games and and, and winning, you know, eight, nine, ten games a year now, uh, I definitely take pride in it because all those guys were in the locker room when I was there. And all those guys were, you know, coming to my apartment or my, you know, things and, and, and hanging out and, you know, 
working out with me extra reps and, you know, me and Hunter Williams and all those guys. So I take pride in it. And, you know, I take, that's, that's the role of a leader. And then it, it, I took a sacrifice and, and I'm, I'm definitely okay with it because now I can wear this weight for his hat, for his hat with pride and, you know, not have to duck my head when I see a Clemson fan or to duck my head when I see a Duke fan is, you know, it's something that you know, I take with pride. So I'm, I'm more than excited about the program. And I think that the, 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 the Cherry on top was that Texas A&M win. I mean, I, I was one of the ones when I was like, yeah, I mean, Clawson's the, you know, Clawson's manifest, it has manifest, manifested, and, uh, and and that's when I realized this program was in good hands. It's just such an exciting football game, too. So. Right, yeah. Just, Jesse like, Bates gripping that punt. I mean, it was something, something, <laughs> something to see for sure. The follow-up question that, Brandon, is when you're going through the second three and nine season, did you get a sense that the talent was building around the program to where they would, you know, start to, to be good in the subsequent? Did you sense that or, or yeah, did you not? Yeah, I did. Um, because, and, and not pointing any fingers, but I would say the offense, my two years with Clawson was, was the weak point, just <laughs> the lack of talent and the lack of execution. But you had guys like Cam Serenade, who I knew was going to be a star and, and holds every record for tight ends at Wake Forest. Maybe not every, but, you know. Uh, in the ACC. In the ACC, so even better. And then you got guys like Walford who even, you know, even through the struggles, he was one of the toughest players I've ever played with. And, you know, he had no help in front of him at certain times and was put in bad situations and still, you know, got up and, and, and dusted the dirt off his shoulders. And then you also, you know, see guys who I'm going against on scout team, you know, the Nate Gilliams, the uh, Jake Benzingers, and, and all those guys and knowing that, you know, they, they're, they're pissing the first team defense off and they're, uh, you know, they're making noise. So that showed me that uh, when these guys get confidence and when these guys get uh, some experience and some opportunities under their belt, um, it'll definitely uh, bring the program together. And the first time I uh, came back from spring or came back for spring practice after I graduated, I could see just the, the tempo of practice was different. The tempo of uh, when a workout was different, the tempo in the weight room was different. And uh, guys were, you know, walking around with, with confidence and, and playing with confidence, even young guys. So um, just changing that whole culture and having that morale that guys come in not expecting to, you know, sit it out for two or three years. They're, they're, they're trying to take the senior spot. So um, I, I saw that coming and it was glad to see it. Um, did I see it coming to, you know, beat in Texas A&M as soon as I left? No, but it definitely, um, it definitely happened and they haven't looked back since. I'll, and I'll leave you with this. Um... NFL draft obviously starts uh, tomorrow. Um, yeah. And as, as a player, what's that um, excitement level for you as, as, as you're entering into the draft process? Because obviously there's, there's at least three to, you know, five or six Deeks who could have their name called. And then also, is this likely to be the most watched NFL draft ever? So the, the process of uh... – the process leading up to the draft, I think, is the most exciting part, you know, uh, not being in college anymore, going off to a different city and literally staying in a hotel or apartment and working out, waking up. And that's all you do. And then that makes it kind of surreal that this is a job. This is something I'm this is the, you know, me prepare for the GMAT, you know, taking three months to study and, and make myself as well prepared as possible and as presentable as possible. And then you have the phases of the you know, the all-star game and the combine. I wasn't a part of either, but I was, you know, working out with guys who were going through these phases. And then you have pro day and uh, being in front of scouts and, and kind of knowing that this is the last who ride before you get to uh, decide your fate of where you go and what city you land in. So uh, I think that the actually leading up to it, the day before and the day of is probably the most nervous, you know, unless you're like a, a day one pick. Like I, I doubt my brother Bradley was nervous, you know, he was probably you know, <laughs> happy as can be knowing that he was going to go and, the first 10 at the at the bare minimum but you know it could everything and everything can change you know if you're the number three linebacker on a guy's board on on the chargers board right and the the two guys they were going to take before you were already taken so now you're the you know they got to take more people to replace those old linemen and running backs they were going to take before you and so it just kind of snowballs it down so you just really have no no idea where you're going to land so i think this is the most nerve wrecking this day and tomorrow and I guess is the, is the draft they're doing all in one day or is it still going to be broken up in two days? It's still broken up. Yeah. Right, so, yeah, I mean, this is, this is one of the, the hardest. I, was, I would advise people, unless they, you know, like I said, you're guaranteed first or second rounder, I wouldn't even watch the draft because it's one of those nerve-wracking things where 
it, it starts to make you doubt yourself, even if, you know, you had nothing to do with you going third round or you going seventh or you going undrafted. So, um, but the prize, I mean, one of my most memorable times in my life is my rookie year, going to the NFL, being around NFL players and realizing, you know, I'm one of them now. And, you know, it was in LA the first time the Rams moved back. So we were staying at the Residence Inn in Oxnard. It was just like our own little campus and just football meetings. And it was just surreal just to uh, experience that and know that, like, this is a job now. So it's interesting. Um, they'll, they'll definitely cherish this moment, uh, but it, it's, it's more to come for sure. And then, and then, like I said, is this likely going to be the most watched NFL so, draft of all time? That's actually a great question. I don't know. Could, just because I've never, I haven't seen a draft commercial yet, I was just – I swear to God – I just texted my brother and my dad and said, the NFL draft is tomorrow, and I haven't heard one word about it. So I don't know. I mean, I probably wouldn't even know if I didn't see a tweet about it this morning. Um, and that's because I follow the guys like Adam Schefter and all those guys, so I'm, I'm bound to see it. But uh, it'll be interesting. Is it is all through Zoom, I'm guessing, huh? Uh, yeah, I believe it's all being done virtually, yeah. So I don't know if you saw the renderings for what it was going to look like in Vegas at the Bellagio, but um, – I mean, that's something I would love to watch, to see the players walking around the, across the Bellagio fountain and see the, 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 the fountain word splash as they're walking down the aisle. Yeah, but that ain't happening. Like, all right. So, if honestly, I, I probably – I won't even watch it just because it'll all be like me in my kitchen with the fans spinning in the background, you know. I just read the ticker in the morning. So, we'll see. Um, any final words you have for, for Deacon Nation? Um. I'm excited, you know, about the program. It's, it's been on the come up. Uh, it's been, you know, in the top of the ACC the past three, four years. Um, I would advise the fans not to doubt Sam Hartman or worry about him. I think the program's in good hands with Sam. Me as an alum and a, a former player and, a, you know, a fan watching the games when Sam did step in for Jamie last year, I saw growth from him from last year uh, compared to the year before. As far as him sitting in the pocket more, having more confidence, uh, trusting his arm, not, you know, being ready to run out the pocket as soon as, you know, the pocket would collapse a little. And I really saw him just sit in there and trust his receivers, trust his own linemen. So I think um, the program's in great hands. Sam, uh, if anybody's fit for that job and that, that uh, pressure, I think Sam, Sam is. And I also think the defense and, you know, guys like Greer, guys like, uh, I always say his name wrong, but Spinda, Sminda. Sminda. Um, yeah, I watched those guys last year come downhill and, and, and ring some bells. So I think, um, you know, it shouldn't be any fear in the, in the, in the uh, Deacon Nation's heart. I think they're still in good hands and the program will continue to move forward. Even, you know, Walker, the uh, running back, Donovan, or is Donovan Green, right? Donovan Green, the wide receiver, yeah. Kenneth Walker, the, the running back. Yep, Donovan Green showed out last year towards the end of the season and, and really made some splashes. Uh, Say Sherrod coming back would be really entertaining. So I, I honestly – I'm I'm expecting nine nine win season minimum, and I think they can pull it off. You know the the interesting thing about the the, the team to me, Brandon, is that they have so much returning on defense, and they they do have a few pieces to replace on offense. This could be potentially their best defensive season, maybe yeah, since forgot, when you yeah, left. Yeah, Boogie Boogie's on the uh, D line, and um, you know all those guys. Uh, and uh, hopefully, if anybody's listening that is a player on the team, don't take it personal if I didn't call your name out. Um, cause like I told Clawson, this is the first year that, um, it will be nobody on the team I played with. So you can wow. imagine guys who were sophomores and freshmen, you know, they were probably getting recruited when you know, I was, you know, third year in my NFL season. So who, who, uh, who, who, uh, knows how far back that is, but, um, I think it's a, it's, it's a lot of promise. I also want to shout you out for the spring game, giving me the player of the year 2015, I think it was. I appreciate that. That <laughs> doesn't you, go unnoticed. Doesn't go unnoticed. Um, you deserved it, Brandon. <laughs> You're a beast for sure. Well, appreciate Brandon, it. thank you so much for your time this this morning, afternoon, and with the More With Less podcast. Um, best of luck with your new business venture. And let's hope that we get an NFL season and you find a way to get out on the field and, and terrorize yeah. some quarterbacks. Yeah, I'm excited. Thanks.